Yeah, but which is which? <laughs> I, I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure I'm, I'm Tom and that's Mac, but you know, there is always confusion about this. Uh, this is uh, our 10th time, as Peter said. Thank you, Peter. Uh, the Africa, the very complete history, a million years uh, in 100 minutes. Um, uh, our 10th time doing this, and each year uh, the subject was keyed uh, to the theme of the Camden Conference, although sometimes fairly loosely. Uh, I want to thank our uh, sponsors. Uh, R.M. Davis, for the fifth year as global sponsor of the, uh, camp of the Tom and Mac show, Mac and Tom show, uh, and uh, the World Affairs Council, Portland Public Library, Unity Foundation, and this year for the first time, uh, the Waterfront, uh, thank you, the sponsor of this evening's show, uh, and uh, they're keeping the kitchen open for us, uh, so I hope you'll join us. Mac and I are going to be there with a uh, a bunch of people and have some supper or maybe a drink or dessert. I hope to see you there. Take it away, Mac. Okay, Africa, the very complete history. Now, most of what most of us learned about Africa, at least people of Tom's and my generation, we learned from the important work done by these two gentlemen. <laughs> uh, it, Edgar Rice Burroughs wrote extensively about Africa, though he never actually went there. Never mind, he wrote a lot about Mars, and he sure as hell didn't go there. Now, the Africa that Burroughs described was a gentle place, by and large, populated by wise yet fun-loving apes, affectionate and loyal elephants, balanced, of course, by evil crocodiles, all, always ready to take a bite out of anyone who gets too near the water. It wasn't unusual in this Africa for a young man, a young white man, to be brought up by apes. And so Natch could understand ape language, particularly handy when there was a damsel in distress. Now, a journalist friend of ours, Robin Lloyd, who lived many years in Africa, asserts that one of Africa's key problems is its lack of roads. Well, that's his view. What we know is that our Africa doesn't need roads due to the excellent system of vines, which can be used to take you quickly from wherever you are to wherever you need to be. Now, the people in that Africa are largely white, including a surprising number of Californians. <laughs> there are, to be sure, a few black people, natives apparently, and they tend to be smaller and blacker, and like the American Indians of our youth, up to no good. Now, as you know, here at the Tom and Mac Show, political correctness reigns. We have a policy of strict gender neutrality, so it's important to point out that our understanding of that Africa was also thanks to a woman. Her name was Nyoka, Nyoka the Jungle Girl, shown here with her faithful dog Fang, uh, a German by birth. In, in her other life, Nyoka was known as Kay Aldridge, Kay Aldridge Tucker of Camden, Maine. Now, now Nyoka's Africa had no black people at all. <laughs> Not one, though there were a few Arabs, they are the ones who looked like Californians with turbans. And the turban was the key. Those that wore them were generally up to no good. There were also a lot of horses and some tumbleweed. Not exactly filmed on location in Africa. <laughs> That's the Africa we grew up on, the deep forest with Tarzan and his apes, the semi-arid Africa of Nyoka and Fang, and, of course, this Africa. <laughs> when Tom and I started our research into the old Africa, we realized there was more to it than what we had grown up on. So what we're hoping to do tonight is give you a deeper insight into Africa and its history, uh, hoping, of course, as we do so, it won't ruin all those great old memories of Tarzan and Jane, Nyoka and Fang, and the African Queen. It's an Africa, uh, an Africa I can tell you that Tarzan would not recognize, but then why should he? We're going back to the beginning, long before Tarzan, or anyone else for that matter, was around. A million years, wow, what a lot to do. Um, we're gonna do it twice, once backward very quickly and then forward in chronological time. Uh, as you move backward, if you go fast enough, you can see uh, the plates actually moving, the, the tectonic plates, uh, and back far enough, Africa becomes part of a supercontinent, which was called Gondwanaland. 
Uh, now, uh, we only promised you a million years, but this was 180 million years back. So you always get more than your money's worth at the Mac and Tom show. <laughs> uh, okay, so now forward in time, uh, you can watch Africa take on uh, its conventional shape. Uh, notice the, the plates are not changing their shape. It's the water level is, is rising and falling. Uh, we stopped the animation at a date uh, about five million years in the past. Uh, and I call your focus uh, to an area on the eastern third uh, of Africa called the Great Rift Valley. Uh, due to a geological uh, anomaly, the Great Rift Valley uh, has this surprising, spectacular vistas with uh, crashing uh, cliffs and deep bottom valleys. Uh, and it is, uh, was formed, uh, as I said, a geological event, the rupture of the African plate about five million years ago along a rift uh, and it divided into the Somali plate to the right uh, and the Nubian plate to the left uh, and created an area of immense ecological diversity, richness, uh, where virtually any species that has ever existed anywhere on Earth uh, at one time or another was in uh, the Great Rift Valley, um, including humans. Uh, humans, uh, the earliest human remains are found all up and down uh, the Great Rift Valley uh, and uh, one of them, I will, the, about four and a half million years ago, uh, was a, a young female whose name was uh, Lucy Australopithecus, and we have an actual photograph of Lucy here. This is not a joke. This is not a joke. There she is. Uh, this, this catches her at an advanced age. I'm sure she was a much you know, more of a looker when she was younger. Um, if you mapped the location of the oldest specimen of each phase of human evolution, the oldest fossil ever found of human evolution, they all show up in Africa, many of them, most of them, in the Great Rift Valley, which leads to a theory called the Out of Africa Theory that all human evolution took place in Africa, uh, and if we find uh, humans elsewhere or proto-humans elsewhere, it's because they migrated out. This is one of two theories. The other theory is the multiple origins theory that humans evolved in five different places uh, around the globe. And you could be uh, an anthropologist and you could believe either of those two theories up until about 1960. With the discovery of mitochondrial DNA, uh, the multiple origins theory becomes untenable. And therefore, anthropologists today, the scientific community today, is absolutely unanimous in ascribing to uh, the out of Africa theory. The non-scientific community is not convinced. And if you were to search on out of Africa theory, uh, you would find uh, a number of fairly angry, loud uh, websites declaring that out of Africa is wrong, uh, that it's a lot of bunk, uh, that uh, it just needs to be refuted, or as this Missouri teenager tells us, that it's pure hogwash. Um, now, why the pushback? Why is it, uh, why all the, uh, the backlash against the out of Africa theory? Well, we have, you know, had a kind of a comfortable view of uh, the various stages of human evolution uh, in which they all looked, you know, kind of like us, right? I mean, fair skin, you know, straight brown hair, aquiline noses, healthy pink complexions. Uh, they look, you know, kind of British. <laughs> right? but, uh, but when they do a reconstruction, a facial reconstruction of the very oldest uh, Homo sapiens remains found in Ethiopia dating from 160,000 years ago, they come to the conclusion that our common ancestors looked more like this. Meanwhile, a few hundred thousand years later, and a few thousand miles to the south, the kingdom of Zimbabwe was flourishing in southern Africa. The ruins of its great capital city, Great Zimbabwe, between the Zambezi and Limpopo rivers, suggest a civilization of considerable ability and organization. They were architects and builders, clearly great traders to have accumulated the wealth to construct the sophisticated stoneworth that was discovered by surprised Europeans in the 19th century. Nor was Great Zimbabwe the first sub-Saharan civilization. One of the great centers of medieval Islamic learning was thriving in the mystical desert capital of the Mali Empire, Timbuktu. At the same time, Oxford and Cambridge were establishing themselves in medieval Europe. The Mali Empire developed in the middle of the 13th century, reaching the peak of its power 100 years later, its power centering on the trade of gold and salt. The most famous 
explorer of his time, the Arab, Ibn Battuta, visited Timbuktu in 1341 at the height of its glory. Uh, Battuta was a, a Muslim. He set out from Tangiers on his Hajj in June of 1325, uh, and it was not just a quickie trip to Mecca. Uh, he uh, had sights to see along the way, including uh, Alexandria, the Red Sea, uh, up to Cairo, Hebron, Damascus, Jerusalem, uh, and finally down to Mecca in November of uh, 1326. Uh, and he still wasn't done. On to Persia, from Persia across Oman, and down to East Africa, uh, and then uh, by sea, uh, up uh, finally at Cairo. This is the first of his three great itineraries. Uh, I'll skip over the second one for a second because it doesn't touch uh, on Africa. The third one is the one that Mac referred to. He starts off uh, in Italy, uh, goes up to, go through the entire Mali Empire, visits Timbuktu, uh, up into Spain, uh, and ends up in Marrakesh. Uh, and I'll just throw his middle itinerary during the, the period of his 30s uh, where he went. Uh, now, many of you have been to some of the same places, but remember he did it at two and a half miles an hour. All right, the Timbuktu this worldwide traveler saw had adopted Islam a century earlier. And as the empire had expanded, Timbuktu had become a cultural and academic center. The Sankore Mosque, whose courtyard was built to the exact dimensions of the Kaaba in Mecca, was converted into a university that at its peak housed 25,000 students and had a library with over half a million manuscripts. Courses for first-year students focused on the study of the Quran, but advanced courses taught mathematics, geography, physics, chemistry, as well as trade and business. Before we leave Batuta and what we can learn from him, uh, a word about his uh, excursions in East Africa. He visited uh, Mogadishu, Zanzibar, Mombasa, and all the way down to Kilwa in present-day Tanzania. Uh, and what he found there during this period that we're calling uh, the pre-colonial age, what he found was evidence of colonies. Uh, at Kilwa, for example, these beautiful mosques uh, in Somalia uh, and in Zanzibar, uh, colonies, but not European colonies. These are much earlier. Uh, these are colonies founded by uh, Omanis, uh, Arabs from Oman, from the city of Muscat, uh, and Persians from the city of Shiraz. Uh, and they traveled in the seventh century or even earlier, a little earlier than that, down uh, into East Africa to trade slaves in ivory. Uh, they, um, uh, they weren't just traders, they settled. Uh, in fact, one Omani sultan uh, moved his capital from Oman to Zanzibar, uh, and, and instead of ruling uh, Zanzibar from Oman, he ruled Oman from Zanzibar. Now, why would he do that? Well, uh, this is Oman, and this is Zanzibar, that's why. Um, <laughs> They got along pretty well, the Arabs from Oman uh, and the Persians from Shiraz uh, got along pretty well until the schism in Islam, uh, in which point increasingly the, uh, the Persians were Shia uh, and the Omanis were uh, Sunni. And the first evidence of Sunni-Shia conflict uh, in Africa uh, takes place in, at, near Kilwa. Uh, but not the last. As we'll see at the very end of our story, there's another interesting incident of Shia-Sunni conflict. Uh, okay. The real the the, the, the the Arabs and the and the Persians were amateurs at colonization. The real pros were about to arrive. Yeah. Now now at this point, as Tom said, Black Africa was virtually unknown to Europeans until Portuguese uh, Portuguese traders began to sail down its west coast in the early 1400s. In 1415, Prince Henry had seized the port of Suetha on the Moroccan coast across from Gibraltar. Here, they were exposed for the first time to the trans-Saharan traffic in gold and slaves, and they set out to capture some of it. The Portuguese had just recently designed a new type of sailing vessel, the Caravelle. The key element of this new vessel was its Latin rigging, which meant it could sail much closer to the wind, a key feature in exploring Africa's west coast, where the wind always blew from the same direction, the north. Square riggers could, of course, sail far south, but then they couldn't come home. Well, now why are we talking about the Portuguese at all? How about the British? Doesn't Britannia rule the waves? Well, not yet. Uh, Britain in this period is sailing a much older class of vessel called the Cog, uh, and it's pretty much limited to sailing downwind. 
And the new caravels were fast and highly maneuverable, with a smaller keel as well that let them sail up the shallow rivers along Africa's coastal waters. As a result of this new technology, the Portuguese soon reached the Azores. A few years after that, they established a trading post at Arguin, in today's Mauritania, where they were profitably, extremely so, involved in the trans-Saharan gold trade. By the time Prince Henry died in 1460, Portuguese vessels were as far south as Sierra Leone, and a decade later, the Lisbon merchant Ferdinand Gomez had reached the Gold Coast of Guinea and was literally coining money from alluvial gold deposits. Then, at Elmina, the Portuguese established the first European settlement in black Africa. The rest was easy. In 1488, that's four years before Columbus made his famous discovery, Bartholomew Dias had rounded the Cape of Good Hope en route to India. The Portuguese indeed ruled the waves. During the 1500s, they were to remain the only European power sailing the coasts of Africa, establishing colonies on both sides of the continent and across the Atlantic and Brazil. Gold, of course, had been Africa's original cash cow, but by 1600, black slaves were rivaling gold as the key export commodity. Indeed, a little known fact, from 1600 to 1900, more black Africans, future slaves, crossed the Atlantic to the New World than did white Europeans. The Portuguese continued to have a monopoly on African trade until the mid-1600s when the Dutch East India Company established a way station for trade with their colony in what is today's Indonesia at the southern tip of Africa. That was in 1652. The Cape Colony, it was, as it was known, gradually became a settler community, the forebears of South Africa's Afrikaners. It was to remain a Dutch settlement for another century and a half until Napoleon entered the picture at the end of the 18th century. When his army overran the Netherlands, the British panicked, fearing Napoleon would use the Dutch Cape Colony as a springboard to attack them in India. So the Brits assembled a large fleet to attack the Cape and quickly overpowered the Dutch. It was to be England's initial foray, and as you see, a defensive one, actually, into black Africa. It whetted England's appetite and France's as well. The scramble was on. The scramble is such a feeding frenzy, it's hard to keep track of who got what when. So, so what I want to do is, instead of going through it chronologically, I want to go through it by colonial power, projecting onto a blank map what each of the colonial powers uh, dominated at its maximum. So here is the maximum uh, French possession, all of, uh, all of the Mali Empire and then some, in including the whole uh, uh, Sahara Desert, beaucoup de sable, as the French say. Uh, this is the English, uh, the English holding from Cape, to Cairo, uh, from Cape Town to Cairo and, and some of West Africa. The Portuguese, as Max said, were early to the game, so they got uh, key... Uh, very lush uh, coastal properties. The Germans did well, four colonies also uh, on the coast. The Belgians are late to the game, so they have to settle for some interior land, although a great deal of it, uh, the Congo, uh, and then the Italians uh, and the Spanish picked up a little bit uh, as well. Now, you might wonder, if I superimposed all of these holdings and put them all on the same map, would there be any of Africa left for the Africans? And the answer is yes. There is the independent kingdom of Abyssinia, independent ever since ever. The present day name of Abyssinia is Ethiopia, but in antiquity, its name was Sheba. And what do you know about Sheba? Well, the queen. Her name was Bilgis, Queen of Sheba, uh, shown here in the 1921 film of that name, uh, played by Betty Blythe. Um, uh, she traveled from Addis Ababa to Jerusalem, 23 centuries before, before Batuta did that. So she's no mean traveler herself. She traveled there to visit Solomon uh, to try him with difficult questions, to prove him with hard questions. Um, the Bible doesn't say what the hard questions were, but the, the Hebrew commentary of the period, period the Targum, uh, details these lovingly. Uh, they're riddles. They're in the form of riddles. If your God is all merciful, how do you explain that? And so forth. And Solomon's elegant answer is also recorded uh, in the Targum. Uh, but that's not all she came for. She also came to commune with him 
of all that was in her heart. Uh, now, there are some people that believe uh, this line is biblical code uh, for hanky-panky. Uh, and the, the Targum uh, does not uh, say, he dances around this, uh, does not say one way or the other what the relationship was uh, with uh, between she, uh, uh, Bilgis uh, and Solomon. Uh, but there's another contemporary source. It's the Ethiopian National Saga. It's called the Kebra Nagast. And it's very explicit that, uh, that she, what was in her heart is she wanted a son, and in communing with her, uh, Solomon gave her one, uh, and she gave birth to Menelik uh, on, the re- on the trip back to, uh, to Sheba, uh, and Menelik becomes the king uh, of Sheba in 950 B.C. Um, he travels back uh, to Jerusalem to visit his father. He's a young man. He visits his father, and, and Solomon gives him a gift. Uh, and now again, the Jewish commentaries and the Ethiopian are a little bit uh, in dispute about what the gift was. Uh, the Hebrew commentary suggests that the gift was a replica of the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, but the Kebra Nagas says, no, it was the Ark of the Covenant. The replica Solomon placed in the temple because he knew that the temple was going to be destroyed. Uh, now, most people don't believe uh, that the Ark of the Covenant went to Ethiopia, but at least one prominent early 20th century archaeologist uh, did believe it was there. Uh, and. <laughs> And he went looking for it, and well, you know the rest of that. Uh, the very last descendant uh, of uh, Bill Geese and Solomon uh, l- reigned uh, until 1974. Uh, he claimed to be a direct descendant of Bill Geese and all of his predecessors, uh, the, the emperors uh, of Sheba, uh, Abyssinia, Ethiopia, claimed them to be direct descendants of, uh, of Solomon uh, and Bill Geese. So the dynasty was 2,924 years old. Now, Eat your heart out, Clintons and Bushes, with your (laughs) candy-ass dynasties. Okay, moving ahead from Solomon and Sheba, let's return to the Dutch. You remember they had controlled the southern tip of Africa since 1652. 150 years later, it's now 1806, the British, worried as I said that Napoleon's going to make a move on the southern coast of Africa, quickly push the Dutch out of the Cape and take it over themselves. A French takeover could interfere with British control of the sea lanes around the Cape of Good Hope to India. Like most colonial endeavors, the Cape Colony was a money loser. But India was a huge exception. When the British arrived in India in 1757, now here's a statistic that seems extraordinary today, India's per capita wealth was higher than England's. When the Brits finally gave it up in 1947, India was one of the poorest countries in the world. The British had sucked all its wealth out. In Africa, by contrast, there wasn't much to suck. The British colonial secretary, Earl Grey, of tea fame, was to conclude, by the middle of the 19th century, that England's Cape policy had been among the most expensive mistakes in the annals of the British Empire. And Gladstone, Prime Minister Gladstone, in the 1880s, was even more brought up about the expense. We have gone a hunting the ends of the earth to find the means of squandering treasure and the lives of our subjects for no conceivable purpose. But that was all about the change. The story of the Cape Colony from this point on is the story of two ambitious men who ended up at each other's throats. The Brit, Cecil Rhodes, was a newcomer to Africa. The Africana, the Boer, that's B-O-E-R, Paul Kruger, had been there all his life, his ancestors having arrived in 1713. Rhodes was largely secular. Kruger, deeply religious. He accepted the Bible as the word of God with interpretations that even for the true believers of his day were far out. Because the Bible refers in several places to the four corners of the earth, he believed the earth was not just flat, it had to have corners. or at least something that would serve as a corner, a place where an angel could stand. (laughs) The British are not satisfied with their coastal colony, so they push into the interior, forcing the Boers to move further inland, where they set up three independent republics, Transvaal, the Orange Free State, and Griqualand. Now, if you've never heard of Griqualand, it's because the Brits quickly swallow it up. Why in the world do the Brits suddenly want this isolated place? Diamonds. 
In 1866, diamonds had been discovered near the remote town of Kimberley, just on the Griqualand side of its border with the Orange Free State. Three large Boer farms, amounting to just 58 square miles, were now the most valuable real estate in the world. In early 1871, the English annexed Griqualand, less, less than five years after the diamond discovery. Britain was the superpower then and could move as quickly as it wanted. Cecil Rhodes arrived a few months after the Brits took over, traveling by foot from the coast. No mean trick then or now. He's 18 years old. He develops his own claim, and he's off and running and quickly becomes a major player. By the mid-1880s, he's getting financial backing from Leopold de Rothschild. Rhodes is just 35 when he forms De, de Beers Consolidated Mine with himself as chairman. His stake in the company worth a million pounds, the equivalent of about 25 million bucks today. Meanwhile, in the Transvaal, Paul Kruger, who had trained as a lawyer, uh, finds himself thrust into the role uh, in the military. Uh, and he's very good at it. He's found his real calling, uh, which is handy because as the Boers have moved to the north, uh, the, uh, they, they came into conflict with all of these ferocious tribes, the Swazi, the, uh, the, the Zulus, the Kossas, the Pedis, uh, and there's conflict absolutely everywhere. Uh, and Ro uh, uh, Kruger is absolutely everywhere uh, and doing it rather masterfully. Uh, things become a little bit more complicated when uh, the... Boers discover in the heart of Boer land uh, a gold, enormous gold field at Witwatersrand, White Water Ridge, or the Rand, uh, as it's called. Uh, within a few years, it's judged to be the richest gold field on earth. Uh, they're taking so much gold out of it that they name their currency the Rand because the gold uh, comes from the Rand. Um, now, Kruger is not yet the president of the Transvaal. Uh, the president of the Transvaal is one uh, Thomas Francois Burgers. Uh, and he and Kruger do not get along. They have theological differences. And uh, Kruger believes that the hand of God uh, is against Burgers. Uh, and as you'll see, uh, uh, that turns out to be true. Uh, Burgers wants to uh, conduct a uh, punitive expedition up along uh, the Limpopo River, the very northern part uh, of the Transvaal, uh, against the tribes there. Uh, and Kruger wants no part of it. He will not help. So Burgess has to do it himself. And he does. He leads the army. He wears a top hat uh, uh, leading the army. Uh, and he has no skill whatsoever at military things. And he's, he's roundly defeated. In fact, uh, the, uh, the tribes chase him back down into the Transvaal. The other tribes in the area, the Zulus in particular, become very restive. He panics. He realizes he's in way over his head. He has to ask, who can he ask for help? The British. He'll ask the British for help. He sets up a meeting with his counterpart, the governor of the Cape Colony, Henry Barclay, uh, and asks for British protection at whatever cost. Uh, on 14 September 1876, a cable from Barclay arrives uh, at the uh, colonial office uh, in London. Uh, it says, Army of President Burgers totally routed. Stop. Boers ask British to take over Transvaal. Stop. Am I to accept proposed session? Disraeli reads this and says, well, well, since they ask, I mean, why not? He sends... He sends a military force to suppress the natives, uh, and uh, they, on uh, um, April 1877, uh, they do annex, uh, Great Britain annexes on behalf of the Cape Colony, uh, the Transvaal, and the Transvaal, and all that gold uh, becomes part uh, of the Cape Colony. Kruger is furious. He's livid. Uh, this is not the will of the Boer people. This is this, this crazy guy that is, uh, was our, uh, our uh, rogue president. Uh, he travels to London to meet with Lord Carnarvon, the colonial secretary. Now, I just mentioned for you, uh, for you Downton Abbey fans, Lord Carnarvon is the, the guy who built Highclere Castle. Um, Carnarvon and Disraeli listen to Kruger ask for, give me back my republic, uh, and then they, yeah, they listen politely, and then they say no. And Kruger realizes if he's going to get it back, he's going to have to take it back. And he's, remember, he's a military guy. He goes back, he forms an army, uh, and he goes to war. This is not the Boer War. This is only the first Boer War. Uh, and at the Battle of Majuba, he handily defeats the British. The British have to sue for peace, and the Transvaal becomes an independent republic again, this time with Paul Kruger as president. Uh, 
a setback for the British, but don't go away. It's not over yet. Uh, in the Cape Colony, Cecil Rhodes has become a member of Parliament, soon to become the Prime Minister, and he has an ambition. His ambition <laughs> is to dominate everything uh, from Cape Town uh, to Cairo, everything in between. He hasn't got a clue what lies in between, but he wants to dominate it. Now, it's uh, too bad Rhodes hadn't spent some time early in his career with a few of the Brits who really did know what lay in between. British explorers had been going deep into the heart of the dark continent for decades and disappearing for years at a time. The best known, now and then, were indeed David Livingston and Henry Stanley. Now, Livingston is well deserving of his place in history for his intrepid and indeed incredible explorations through Central Africa. And even better known, of course, for that famous greeting he received, as you just saw from Henry Morton Stanley, upon finding him after a two-year search in Ujiji along the shores of Lake Tanganyika. Stanley, at the time, was a very young reporter. He had just turned 30. He was working for the New York Herald. He'd been sent out to find Livingston. Livingston was nearly 60 years old and the most famous explorer in the world. He'd been missing for four years. Livingston had been exploring Africa for nearly 30 years by then. Born dirt poor in a mill town in Scotland, his father an evangelical Christian, Livingston joined the London Missionary Society in his early 20s and set off for Africa, where in addition to helping spread the gospel, he could work, he hoped, at eliminating the slave trade. His geographical travels and discoveries were prodigious. Up from Port Elizabeth on the southern coast of Lake Ngami in 1849, Victoria Falls in the Zambezi Valley a few years later when he was blazing a trail across Central Africa, and in his last years, Lake Nyasa and the River Nilabala. Now, that, that looks impressive, but it's more impressive than it looks because Africa is bigger than it looks. Africa is an enormous continent. It's big enough uh, to assume the la land mass of the United States and China and India and all of Europe. Uh, so that gives us the opportunity to, just for comparison purposes, uh, to compare what uh, Livingston did to a another set of great explorers, Lewis and Clark. So here we've got Lewis and Clark out and back, uh, and here David Livingston. Uh, and you can see why he was indeed judged to be the world's greatest explorer at this moment. But for all the glory of discovery, he found, too, what he called the open sore of the world, a revived and thriving slave trade. Livingston's motto was the three C's, Christianity, commerce, and civilization. He wasn't the only European in, in Africa in those days to claim such high-minded ideals but he may well have been the only one who actually believed them. His hope was that his exploration would open commercial trade routes in Central Africa that would prove more profitable than the slave trade and therefore make it obsolete. Obsessed as he was, he became almost a tragic figure. His health seriously deteriorated. He was practically reduced to begging from the Arab slave traders to stay alive. Soon after, the brash young Stanley, Stanley was half his age, found Livingston. The two developed a close friendship, the mentor and the mentee. Uplifted by the re respect and admiration he was shown, Livingston's health improved to such an extent that he started planning yet another trip, this one to find the source of the Nile. 
Livingston was convinced that the source was, in fact, a stream running into Lake Banguiola, which would then flow on through the lake into the Luabala River and from there to the Nile. He was wrong. The source of the Nile was much further north. But the good news, to the extent that there was any good news from this trip, is that Livingston never knew he was wrong. The trip itself was a dreadful one, through an interminable swamp with Livingston getting weaker by the day. Towards the end, he had to be carried by a litter. Finally, in the pre-dawn hours of May 1st, 1873, he was found dead, kneeling at his bed, praying, it was later claimed, for the end of slavery. What followed was, in its own way, every bit as remarkable as Livingston's own explorations. His young African helpers cut out his heart and buried it in the village where he had died then dried his body in the African sun for weeks, wrapped it in bark, which they then lashed to a pole, and carried for a thousand miles to the coast opposite Zanzibar, where it was shipped back to England. It was therefore a year after his death that Livingston was finally laid to rest with the kind of pomp and circumstance that would have mortified him in the nave of Westminster Abbey. Stanley was one of the pallbearers, he was to return to Africa and accomplish what his mentor had never been able to do, identify the source of the Nile. But on a more important level, Livingston had succeeded. His descriptions of the barbarity of the slave trade <coughs> had finally brought the issue before the European public. The slave trade was indeed barbarous. Uh, we're not here to tell you that. You already know that. Uh, but a few things you might not have noticed, uh, learned along the way. Uh, first of all, the magnitude of the trade uh, as Max said, the, the Arabs, the uh, uh, Africans uh, going across the Atlantic between uh, 1500 and 1900, there were more of them across the Atlantic uh, than there were Europeans. Uh, but that's only part of the slave trade. There's also the trade to the east, and that's been going on since the seventh century. Uh, it's quite possible, <coughs> excuse me, it's quite possible that more uh, slaves were transported, African slaves transported east than west just because it had been going on for so much longer. Anytime you hear anything about African commerce of this period, you'll hear the phrase slaves and ivory. I, I always thought those two were just related uh, geographically, but no, they're not. They're much more tightly linked than that because the slaves carried uh, the ivory. Uh, a well-armed slave trader would go into the interior, buy some slaves uh, from an uh, from a African chieftain, go to a place where he could acquire uh, ivory, and the slaves would carry the ivory back to, uh, back to the coast. One of the slave traders uh, tells uh, Livingston uh, that if a woman is carrying both a baby uh, and a tusk of ivory uh, and she starts to fall behind, he is obliged, he's just obliged uh, to spear the baby. It breaks his heart, he says, but uh, what are you going to do? Business is business. Uh, anybody who falls behind has to be killed. Uh, you can't leave an, a living, exhausted slave uh, on the trail, otherwise they will all profess to be exhausted. Uh, and he calls this spoilage. He says, any commercial activity has spoilage. I mean, think about your house in London. You need ice, you order, you need, you need 200 pounds, you order 250. Why? Some of it's going to melt along the way. That's spoilage. Same with the slaves. Same with the slaves. The economics of the slave trade are very impressive. You can buy at Khans, a village uh, near Lake Tanganyika, you can buy a girl uh, for uh, 12 pieces of Marikani cotton. Uh, you buy it at worth you know, half a dollar, a quarter. Uh, 12 pieces of cotton. Um, it, it, by the way, the prices are always expressed in price per girl because the East African slave trade, headed as it is to India, Persia, and Oman, uh, is for domestic use. There's no agriculture there. Uh, no, no slaves needed for agriculture. Domestic use and misuse only. Uh, so it's all about girls. Now, there are occasional uh, men and boys uh, sold in Zanzibar, but they have to be castrated first, uh, and that's such a bother for everyone. Um, the uh, British and the Americans, uh, being prudes, were very pleased when the, Brits, when the Africans uh, covered their nudity, but the, the Marikani cloth shown in this picture was purchased at the price of one girl. That same girl would sell uh, for $25 in Zanzibar and $100 in Muscat. So you can see that the economics are, are very attractive. So Africa is a kind of assembly line pumping out product, that's slaves, uh, with a little bit of spoilage along the way and tidy profits for everyone along the, uh, in the course of it. Uh, the Slave Trade Act, British Slave Trade Act of 1807, 
uh, let the uh, British Navy take on the slave trade. They were ordered to suppress it. They had limited success in the Atlantic and almost none in the uh, Indian Ocean. Why? Because the demand is so great. The profits are so great. The slave traders just found a way around them. Uh, interdiction uh, is not a, a winning tactic when the demand is that great. Let's, the, the analogy is the drug trade in the United States. I mean, we can't even keep the drugs out of our prisons because the demand is so great. Uh, a final point about the slave trade, distance makes it all seem less horrible. So for instance, this man, uh, King Leopold of Belgium, uh, is the greatest slave owner of all time, owns hundreds of thousands of slaves as his personal possessions. Uh, and never goes to Africa, never has to set eyes on a single one of them, uh, doesn't have to see the atrocities uh, committed in his name. Uh, he simply uh, reaps the profit. Now, the rest of us got some solace from distance as well. So, for instance, this piano uh, that was in your parents' house or your grandparents' house that had keys made of ivory, remember this one? If it was old enough, almost certainly the, that ivory was carried to the market by slaves. Uh, maybe you took uh, a lesson or two uh, on that piano as well. The British are valiantly trying to suppress the slave trade wherever it is, the Atlantic, the Indian Ocean, uh, and the Nile, the Upper Nile uh, in particular, uh, Sudan. So, Mac, tell us what's happening in the Sudan. Okay, now, now this uh, ain't a happy chapter for the Brits, even though it involves one of Victorian England's greatest personalities. Charles George Gordon was a national figure, more celebrated than any of his con contemporaries, including even Livingston. Unfortunately, Gordon was killed at Khartoum in 1885, a victim of not just the religious fanaticism of his enemy, but as you'll see, of his own hubris as well. But I'm way ahead of our story. Colonel Gordon of the British Royal Engineers was 41 when he first went to Africa in 1873. He was already famous for his exploits in the Crimean War, and then half the world away, he led the Chinese soldiers that put down the Taiping Rebellion earning him the nickname Chinese Gordon. He was to end up in Africa quite by chance when the Egyptian prime minister running into Gordon at the British embassy in Constantinople offered him the governorship of Equatoria province along the Upper Nile, which the Egyptian government had taken over a few decades earlier. Gordon was as, as successful there as he had always been. By the time he left, it was said a lone traveler could wander the area armed with nothing more than a walking stick. A true marvel at that time, and probably now for that matter. But worn out by the hot, humid equatorial climate and his own hyperactivity, reportedly he never took a day off from work during his two and a half years there. And remember, there was no air conditioning in, that, in anywhere at the time. So Gordon stepped down in 1876, but within a few months, the Khedive of Egypt invited him back to Africa this time to be governor general of the whole of the Sudan. Arriving in Cairo to meet with the Khedive, Gordon demanded total autonomy, full powers to suppress the slave trade. In his laconic style, Gordon described the meeting to a friend a few days later. Then I began and told him all, and then he gave me the Sudan, and I leave on Sunday. The climate of Khartoum at the confluence of the White Nile and the Blue Nile was as unrelenting as that of Equatoria province. And Gordon's peripatetic lifestyle, he traveled over 9,000 miles, always on camel, during the 30 months he ran the Sudan, meant that by 1879 he had had enough and returned to England. Not to slow down, though, first he was off to India as private secretary to the viceroy. Not an ideal job for the headstrong Gordon. He quit after three days. Although a soldier of the British Army, he was soon to be promoted to Major General, he acted more like a soldier of fortune, immediately, immediately setting off for Peking, where there were rumors of war with Russia. Nothing came of that, so next he was in Cape Town, negotiating with the Cape Colony government, who wanted him to lead their campaign against the rebellious Basutos. He turned that down and then took a year's leave to move to Jerusalem. He had always been something of a mystic to immerse himself in the Holy Land. Returning through Brussels, it was now late 1883, and remember, travel in those days did not involve hopping on a jet. He quickly accepted an offer from King Leopold to work in the, in the Congo with our old friend Stanley. But meanwhile, during his hectic travels, things had been unraveling in parts of the Sudan. 
a revolution was underway, led by the Mahdi, as he styled himself, the guided one, the long prophesied redeemer of Islam, the successor to Muhammad, an incredibly charismatic individual who raised the cry for jihad, holy war. Gordon immediately saw the danger the Mahdi's success had created. In an interview with the Pall Mall Gazette, he spoke of that risk. The Mahdi has already excited dangerous fermentation in Arabia and Syria. If the whole of the eastern Sudan is surrendered to him, Gordon warned, the Arab tribes on both sides of the Red Sea will take fire. Reacting to Gordon's fears, the Gazette placed a front page editorial in that same issue, suggesting that General Gordon be sent with full powers to Khartoum to assume absolute control of the territory, to relieve the garrisons, to do what can be done, to save what can be saved from the wreck in the Sudan. In effect, Gordon had cooked his own goose. Uh, the public response to the media uh, and the clamor uh, caused uh, Prime Minister Gladstone uh, to agree reluctantly to send uh, Gordon to Khartoum, reluctant because he really didn't care about the garrison. Gladstone would have let it be overrun. 6,000 Egyptians, who cares? Uh, th why, why that attitude? Well, because the, uh, the, the, the Sudan was a money-losing boondoggle for Egypt. And Egypt is flat broke, deep in debt to the British banks. Egypt, 1884, is equal to Greece, 2015. Uh, in debt to the British banks, uh, so all he really cares about uh, is getting the, money, getting the money out of Sudan, the waste to conserve it for the creditors. Um, they've established a protectorate by which the British are running uh, Egypt, but it isn't really a protectorate, it's really a receivership. They're really there just to conserve assets. But what the hell, one guy, how much can that cost? It's, it was the perfect Rumsfeldian uh, um, light footprint. Uh, in, in a moment of exuberance, uh, 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 Gladstone gives him a staff of one, uh, Colonel J.D.H. Stewart. Uh, now, Gordon understands that his role is to go down and write a report. That's it, just that. Go there, write a report about how to evacuate the garrison. But on the trip, he starts, the, 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 the ship puts into ports and he sends telegrams uh, to Gladstone saying, talking about um, accomplishing uh, the evacuation. And then he gets even uh, more uh, enthralled. The Mahdi must be smashed up. He's still not at Cairo. Uh, at present, it would be comparatively easy to destroy the Mahdi. Mission creep uh, on a fantastic scale here. Um, he arrives in Khartoum February 18th, 1884. Remember the date. February 18th, uh, to a tumultuous welcome uh, at Government House, where he had been uh, governor before, and he immediately begins to lay plans uh, to smash up the Mahdi. Uh, on March 13th, the Mahdi closes off the river to the north, cuts the cable, uh, making, uh, rendering uh, Khartoum completely isolated, and surrounds the city, and thus begins a siege uh, of 10 months, but it's, it's actually already over as of March 13th. Gordon hadn't even been there a month. On January 26th, uh, 1885, uh, the Mahdi moves in. Uh, Gordon has 6,000 troops, the Mahdi has 50,000. Uh, they take terrible losses, but nobody seems to care. Uh, they're not so much an army as a, as a furious mob. Uh, they pour uh, into the compound, uh, and the end is uh, what we uh, learn to, to expect. Uh, Gordon uh, is killed along with every single male member uh, of the garrison. Uh, the Mahdi spares no one except enslavable girls uh, and women. Uh, the sad thing is uh, that Gordon has completely misread uh, his opposition. Uh, he believed the modest revolution was about uh, Arab misrule in the area. He believed, he even wrote about it, the great evil is not at Khartoum, uh, it's at Cairo. Anybody who has ever lived uh, in an Egyptian-run province will not need to be told why the people of the Sudan uh, have risen in, in revolt. He thinks they're rebelling because of uh, Egyptian misrule, and if he institutes what he had before, a liberal regime, that the modest revolution will dry up. But the modest revolution was never about misrule, it's about religion. The Mahdi is a Twelver. It's a branch of Shia Islam. 
The garrison is staffed with Sunni Egyptians. The Mahdi doesn't want to treat with them. He wants to kill them. Gordon has blundered into a religious war. He's got no dog in the fight, but there it is, and he never realizes it. The end of General Gordon, January 26, 1885, uh, less a participant than collateral damage in somebody else's religious war. Okay, our, our dead martyr, Gordon, before he decided to go to Khartoum, you remember, had had an offer from Belgium's King Leopold to go to the Congo, a much safer area, at, at least for white men. Leopold, who had been on the throne of Belgium for 20 years, he, he became king when he was only 30, was very ambitious. Belgium was a small country, but Leopold had big plans. And sitting in his palace at Laeken in January 1876, he was mesmerized by a report in the London Times. The early edition made it across the channel and was delivered to the palace by the Brussels Express in time to be read by Leopold at breakfast. The article, headlined African Expedition, was the story of a three-year trek by a Scottish explorer, Verney Cameron, across Africa from the East Coast to the West. The article quotes Cameron as describing the area he had explored as a magnificent country of unspeakable richness. Silver, copper, iron, and gold are abundant. Leopold had long been obsessed with carving out an overseas empire for his small uh, country. Il faut à la Belgique une colonie. He had carved on a fragment of marble he had taken from the Parthenon 15 years earlier. Colonies, he told his Minister of Finance, give modern states power and prosperity. He'd even tried to persuade Spain to sell them the Philippines halfway around the world. Money was no problem for Leopold. He was not just a king. He was personally one of the richest men in Europe, having inherited a private fortune from his parents. And so it was that on September 12, 1876, Leopold convened a conference at his palace in Brussels with a dozen of Europe's most famous explorers, French, uh, German, British. The King's Conference was devoted, of course, to those traditional high European ideals of Christianity, commerce, and civilization. And Leopold's opening speech was masterful. To open to civilization the only part of our globe where it has yet to penetrate, to pierce the darkness is, I dare say, a crusade worthy of this century of progress. Needless to say, Leopold emphasized to the enraptured attendees, in bringing you to Brussels, I am in no way motivated by selfish designs. The conference was hailed throughout Europe for its idealism, its crusade against the slave trade. Leopold's real purpose was to be made clear in a letter to the Belgian ambassador in London a few months later. I do not want to miss a good chance of getting us a slice of this magnificent African cake. The conference played out just as Leopold had envisioned. It was agreed that a new organization, the International African Association, would be set up, which Leopold graciously offered to chair for a year. He was never replaced, but then after one meeting of the governing body the following year, the association never met again anyway, and no one noticed. The scramble was in high gear. The British and the French had already made their moves in Africa, and so, of course, had the Portuguese. And despite his lack of interest in the whole enterprise, Bismarck had realized it was not in the long-term interest of Germany to let his European rivals divide up Africa. So Germany, too, was about to make its move. So a new conference is required to uh, establish rules for governance of uh, this common cake. Uh, th this particular conference is under the auspices of uh, Prince Otto von Bismarck. Uh, it meets in Berlin, uh, and 14 countries take part. And no Africans, by the way, were invited, as they hadn't been invited to uh, Brussels. What earthly interest could they have? Um, and I wasn't there, but I, I just bet uh, that the term uh, self-government uh, was not used at this conference uh, because, you know, self-government just not right for, uh, for Africans. For Africans, you need despotism, the legitimate mode of government in dealing with the barbarians, provided that the end be their improvement, and that was always everybody's end. Everybody felt, felt that. The conference convenes on Saturday, November 15, 1884, at the Reichschancellerie on Wilhelmstrasse, 
uh, in Berlin. Uh, the delegates met in front of an 18-foot high map of Africa uh, on which the carving was to take place. Uh, Bismarck opens with an impassioned uh, 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 address about the three C's, commerce, Christianity, and civilization, and the improvement of the African native. He lays out the goals for the conference free trade in the Congo, free navigation of its rivers, uh, and figuring out who gets what. Now, you might think who gets what was the, the key thing on everybody's mind. No. No. Th there's so much Africa there. It's so huge. There's plenty for everybody. And they've all got their stakes in the ground anyway. No, it was number one that mattered most to them. Uh, free trade in the Congo. The Congo is so huge, they don't want anybody to dominate it. So uh, everybody ought to be able to, uh, to trade there. Uh, the great winner of this extravaganza is Leopold, because he gets the prize. The prize, uh, his colony, the Congo, uh, is one-thirteenth the size of Africa. It's big enough to dominate uh, most of Europe and 76 times larger than Belgium. Um, why does he get this? Well, because he seduced them. He, he has convinced them that it's not going to be his colony. Oh, yes, he'll, he'll administer it. But it's our colony. It's an international endeavor with free trade for everyone. Free trade uh, was the key thing. Leopold is not at the conference. It was ambassadors only. But when his, his name is mentioned at the signing ceremony, the crowd erupts in applause. Even the Iron Chancellor is seduced by his self-effacing magnetism. He says, the Congo State will be the most important example of the work that we have agreed to. I express my best wishes for the realization of the noble aspirations of its illustrious creator, uh, King Leopold uh, of Belgium. And again, the crowd goes wild. Okay, let's jump ahead briefly. Enough of those conferences among the European powers. Let's see what happens when they run into each other in Africa unexpectedly and with opposing agendas. It's 1898. We're in a small Nile town somewhere in the middle of the Sudan, where a famous British military figure is confronted by an intrepid French adventurer. First, the Brit. He was Horacio Herbert Kitchener eventually to become an icon, actually the icon of the British military establishment. Indeed, he was the model for this World, one, World War I poster, for the very obvious reason that everyone in England would have recognized him. But at our moment, 1898, he is merely a newly minted major general. Kitchener had many, uh, eventually millions, of admirers, but no friends. People who knew him either disliked him or loathed him. Am <laughs> ambitious, cold-blooded, merciless, he had little or no regard for his underlings. When we, enjoy, when we join him in 1898, he has just completed avenging Gordon's death 13 years earlier by returning to Khartoum, the scene of the crime, and wiping out the remainder of the modest forces for which Queen Victoria would make him a peer of the realm, Baron Kitchener of Khartoum. In the process, he had killed nearly 20,000 Mahdist soldiers in a single morning. A young Winston Churchill was there serving under Kitchener. Churchill writes that the Mahdists swarmed down to the river's edge. The British, offshore in their gunboats, mowed them down with Gatling guns and heavy artillery. For the most part, the British never even got their feet wet. Retiring for lunch, Kitchener noted, we gave them a good dusting. Since he had utter disdain for the soldiers who served him, they adored him. When they broke out into cheers for him after the battle, he was so moved, one of his officers was to observe that he seemed almost human for a quarter of an hour. <laughs> Immediately after Khartoum, Kitchener and his gunboats proceed further down the Nile to get on with the main business at hand, reconquering the rest of the Sudan. As luck would have it, a French expeditionary force sent from the Atlantic to grab some more of Africa for the French uh, across the Red Sea was the plan, bumps into Kitchener at the little town of Fashoda. A potentially uneasy encounter. The leader of the French expedition is uh, Major Jean-Baptiste Marchand, uh, and uh, he has a very tiny force, 20 uh, French officers and non-commissioned men, uh, and 100-plus uh, 
uh, native porters and, and soldiers. Uh, and of course, Kitchener has thousands of troopers in his gunboats with the Gatling guns. So if it had come to a battle uh, between them, it would have been over almost instantly. But then what? You know, war between Britain and France over Fashoda? Uh, not, not too likely. And yet, nobody's quite ready for war, but nobody can back down either. Uh, because if you were to draw a line representing British ambitions from Cape to Cairo and another one representing French ambitions from Senegal to the Red Sea, uh, you would see that those two lines passed uh, each other, crossed each other almost exactly uh, at Fashoda. Uh, and so uh, what they find themselves on 18 September 1898, uh, each surprised at the presence of the other, what's called for uh, is some diplomacy and reticence, not exactly uh, Kitchener's uh, strong suit. But it turns out he's rather charming with the French. He, he's a Francophile. He speaks nearly perfect French, and he never misses a chance to show it off. Uh, and so there's a standoff, but it's a peaceful one. Well, they both cable back to their capitals uh, for instructions. What the hell do we do now? The newspapers uh, back in France and in England uh, are trying to stir up uh, a spirit for a battle, but uh, uh, finally it's all resolved absolutely peacefully with a magnanimous exchange of gifts. gifts. Now watch this. The French give the Sudan to the British. The British, not to be outdone, give the French Morocco. I mean, of course, there are no Sudanese or Moroccans involved in this, but this is the 19th century, uh, so it all ends uh, fairly peacefully. Um, we haven't seen the last of uh, Kitchener yet. Uh, he's going to figure in Africa. We're, he's going to figure in a, in a later chapter. But before that, let's go back to uh, see what King Leopold is doing with his Congo adventures. Yeah, uh, you remember when last we left King Leopold and his Congo, because that's what it was, his personal fiefdom, he was the toast of Europe for his wisdom, his courage, his nobility, his idealism. <laughs> it was hardly surprising then that in November 1889, Brussels was chosen to host a worldwide anti-slavery conference. In fact, Richmond, Virginia in 1889 would have been a more appropriate place for an anti-slavery conference. The king proposed extensive plans for fighting the slave traders. Fortified posts, roads, railways, steamships, all needed, he said, to support the troops required to fight the slavers. Leopold generously offered the services of his new Congo state towards the conference's noble end, asking in return only that the conference authorize him to levy import duties to finance his attack on slavery which was naturally agreed to, thus amending in Leopold's favor the agreement from the Berlin Conference four years earlier, which in guaranteeing free trade was the key reason Leopold had been given the Congo in the first place. Now, quite coincidentally, just as Leopold's anti-slavery conference was about to kick off, a black American, George Washington Williams, working for an American newspaper syndicate, visits Brussels and interviews Leopold. And like everyone else was duly impressed, one of the noblest sovereigns in the world, Williams wrote, whose highest ambition is to serve the cause of Christian civilization. <laughs> Williams' dream had long been to line up work in the Congo for former black slaves living in poverty in the American South. But when Williams told Leopold he was planning to visit the Congo, he was surprised when Leopold tried to persuade him to call off his trip. Williams was to spend the entire year of 1890 in Africa, six months of which were in the Congo. Coincidentally, the very same months when Leopold was hosting his anti-slavery conference. And what Williams saw there appalled him. In a 12-page pamphlet, an open letter to His Serene Majesty King Leopold II, which got wide distribution in the United States and Europe, he detailed the horrors he saw calling the Congo the Siberia of the African continent and specifically indicting Leopold's rule. Your Majesty's government is engaged in the slave trade, wholesale and retail. It buys and sells and steals slaves. It pays three pounds per head for able-bodied slaves for military service. Leopold counterattacked. There was a brief furor. Even the, the Belgian parliament discussed William's open letter. But six months later, 
Williams was dead from tuberculosis he had picked up during his African travels, and his attacks on Leopold were quickly forgotten. So let's take time out for a moment from our focus on how Belgium was bringing Christianity, commerce, and civilization to the Congo, and see if England's approach in Africa was any better. The first Boer War, you remember, was a disaster for Great Britain. The second Boer War is a disaster for everyone, but the British, they felt they had to take this, uh, this uh, war on. They had to reconquer uh, the Transvaal. They just had to. There were seven key reasons why they needed to do that. Um, <laughs> Uh, the gold fields uh, are at the Witwatersrand, as I said, uh, which is quite near Johannesburg, and the, uh, Johannesburg has become a boom town with gold rushers uh, arriving from all quarters. Some of them are Boers, but most of them aren't. In fact, uh, if you, the, the Transvaal population in 1889 uh, was 62,000 Boers and 48,000 Uitlanders, that's Dutch for uh, foreign residents. Uh, but by some counts, there were also that many, again, uh, of unregistered Uitlanders. So they think 100,000 Uitlanders on the Rand alone. How, how, Lord knows how many there are uh, in other places. Uh, Rhodes, by this time, uh, is uh, prime minister of the Cape Colony. And he has announced that the development of the African interior, all of it, uh, is the birthright uh, of the Cape Colony. And he's already made some moves in that direction. Uh, the, uh, uh, he's moved uh, up to the north of the Transvaal to an area uh, where it says Zimbabwe up there, that's a modern map, uh, that he calls Rhodesia in, in great modesty. Uh, and Rhodesia is not, is not part of the Cape Colony per se. It's actually a wholly owned uh, territory of a charter company which is owned by Rhodes. So it's kind of his uh, person. No wonder it's called Rhodesia, right? Uh, they have their own company police. Uh, and in 1895, Rhodes uh, uses that company army uh, to send it into um, the Transvaal to try to form, foment an uprising of all those British miners there uh, in the hopes that uh, he can get the, uh, the Transvaal uh, turned back to Great Britain. Uh, he sends this group in under the leadership of his colleague, his friend, his personal physician, uh, Dr. Leander Starr Jameson. This is the famous Jameson Raid. Uh, it's a total botch. Uh, the, the Boers get, get word of it. They arrest Jameson at the border. He never even gets into the Transvaal before he's arrested. Uh, and in his baggage, they find cables from Rhodes showing that Rhodes had planned the whole thing. Rhodes is completely disgraced. He's obliged to step down uh, as, uh, as prime minister uh, of the Cape Colony. Uh, the new prime, prime minister takes a different tack. At a meeting uh, in uh, the Orange Free State, uh, the British demand demand that every single British subject in the Transvaal be given full rights uh, of citizenship in the Transvaal, including voting rights. Uh, I mean, Kruger is, is deeply offended by this. I mean, hello? Uh, where do you get off with this? He could also do the math. I mean, 100,000 Uitlanders uh, can outvote 62,000 Boers. Uh, and so he refuses, and the war is on. Uh, we won't go into the details of the war, uh, particularly grim fighting. Uh, but just say that uh, at the very beginning, uh, the Boers seem to be doing well. They attack Kimberley. They move into British territory. They've bought a lot of uh, heavy equipment. Kruger is uh, invested in military uh, force. Uh, but, uh, you know, the British have got just way too much resource to call on. They bring in massive reinforcements. Uh, and they bring in the guy with a hot hand, uh, uh, Lord Kitchener, uh, who is utterly merciless in conducting the war. He starts a forced, a, a scorched earth campaign. He burns throughout the Transvaal, the farms, kills all the livestock, uh, and poisons all the wells. The, the Boer soldiers are living off the land. He's determined to make the land impossible to live on. But there are non-combatants living on the land. What, how about them? How about the Boer women and children? Concentration camps, he decides. In fact, this may be the first use of the term uh, in history. The concentration camps have got damn little to eat, a terrible uh, sanitation, and the death rate, particularly among children, uh, is atrocious. Um, it is a fairly successful tactic, uh, and the Boers uh, eventually uh, have to yield. Uh, it was brutal, but you know it did accomplish its purpose, right? The British got the gold, right? Well, 
Not exactly. The gold reverts to the stakeholders of the RAND, the mines on the RAND. And those stakeholders are companies owned by uh, Rhodes, Jameson, and Rothschild. The British public has paid the entire cost of the war, but the benefit went to three rich magnates. Now, this is a beautiful example of crony capitalism uh, at work. Let's put up the score. Who won this war? Well, you know, in one sense, the Boers won because they killed a lot more British uh, combatants than the British killed of them. Uh, but then you figure in uh, the civilian deaths, and you can see that, uh, no, the, the British won handily because they killed a lot of women and children in the concentration camps. But it's a little worse than that because there are also black people living on the land. 107,000 in the Transvaal alone. They can't live on the land. The water has been, the, the wells have all been poisoned. Uh, so they're put into concentration camps too. Now, not the same concentration camps, not in South Africa, separate concentration camps, and nobody keeps track uh, of their death rate. It's horrific, but nobody keeps track because they're just blacks. But if they died in the same proportion as the whites in their concentration camp, that could be another 50,000 dead. So the ratio uh, of non-combatants to combatants killed by the British uh, is 9 to 1. This is Guinness Book of Records stuff here. will last until uh, the Nazis come along. Well, that's how the British uh, bring civilization uh, to Africa. Can even the Belgians top that? Well, <clears throat> the last time we visited the Belgian Congo, more properly at the time, King Leopold's Congo, the black American newspaper man, George Washington Williams, had just published his expose of the horrors the Belgians were unleashing on the natives. While there was a momentary uproar, it quickly died down, and during the 1890s, the gay 90s as they were known here, the Gilded Age, when the exploitation of the Congo and the atrocities associated with it was at its worst, Leopold was able to protect his empire from prying eyes. Ironically, when Williams was on his last voyage down the Congo River to return to England and his early death, he was only 41, his steamboat would have crossed paths with another boat, the aptly named Roi de Belge, heading up the river with supplies for the Belgian colonialists. The second in command was a young Polish adventurer, Konrad Korzynowski, Joseph Conrad, as he was to be known to his literary public. Conrad was to spend six months in the Congo in 1890, but would not write his masterpiece about what he saw there, Heart of Darkness, until the end of the decade. It was not a bestseller at that time and had little impact on the tragedy that Leopold was creating, but it provides the best first-hand description of the exploitation of the Congo. It was just kicking into high gear when Conrad was there. Early on, Marlowe, the narrator, that's clearly Conrad's alter ego in the novel, is steaming up the Congo River, looking through his binoculars at the house of Mr. Kurtz, the local boss of the ivory trading company Marlowe will be working for. What had seemed to the naked eye to be fancy knobs decorating the fence posts of Kurtz's house, Marlowe, Conrad, suddenly realizes that each knob is black dried, sunken with closed eyelids, a head that seemed to sleep at the top of that pole and with the shrunken dry lips showing a narrow white line of its teeth. This was not fiction. Uh, that slide, that's Leon Rahm, the Belgian station chief at Leopoldville, famous in his day, well known for his collection of 21 heads surrounding the flower garden in front of his house at Leopoldville. Clearly, Conrad's model for Kurtz. Uh, Conrad's in the Congo in 1890, uh, and at that time, the rubber trade is just getting started. Rubber is a perfect industry for converting free labor uh, into profit, because there's no capital equipment whatsoever. Uh, all you really need uh, is labor. Uh, and that year, 1890, uh, there's 100 tons of rubber exported. Uh, but 10 years later, it's 6,000. It's gone up 60-fold. So, of course, you need a lot more labor. Uh, and where do you get them? Uh, you, you need this because it's the supply to the engine that produces the profit. Uh, where do you get the supply with people that don't want to be supply? Well, in order to do that, uh, they form 
uh, a force publique, a mercenary army of Africans uh, led by Belgians, uh, 20,000 strong, the biggest army uh, in Central Africa. Uh, and their job is to recruit workers uh, to give uh, supply. And if, and if village, villagers don't want to be supply, well, you make war against them. A hundred heads cut off. This is the, this is the LePage solution, I understand. A yeah? <laughs> hundred heads cut off, and there have been plenty of supplies uh, ever since. Um, suppose they don't want to work. To gather rubber in the district, one had to cut off hands, uh, noses, uh, and ears. Uh, the Belgians have supplied a handbook, a five-volume handbook, uh, to all of their agents uh, that tells, among other things, uh, how to catch the people that run away. Uh, taking prisoners in Africa is easy, for if the natives hide, they will not go far from their villages and must come back to look for food in the gardens uh, which surround it. Now, despite uh, uh, Leopold's best efforts, some of the reports of the atrocities uh, are starting to make their way back into uh, the, uh, into Europe, uh, in particular through the missionaries uh, who have taken some pictures. They have a picture of a chief uh, standing uh, with the hands uh, that the force publique has cut off uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, work, the, the hands cut off of people that were not willing uh, to do the work. Uh, this is a, a public relations problem for Leopold, so he mounts a public relations uh, counteroffensive by establishing a, a commission for the protection uh, of the Congo, of the natives of the Congo state. Uh, and in staffing this, in choosing the people to be part of the commission, he plays the God card. He has three Catholic priests and three foreign missionaries. Uh, one of the Catholic priests is even a Belgian bishop. Uh, and uh, he, uh, this is a farce. They never meet. The six of them never come together because the distances are so huge they can't travel there. And the whole thing is disbanded a year later anyway. In the summer of 1897, he begins tirelessly to work uh, the royal family circuit. He goes to England, Austria, Sweden, warmly received everywhere. This is a, a, a salesman uh, par, par excellence selling the idea of a benevolent uh, regime uh, in the Congo. Um, you've got to admire this guy. I mean, he is really good at being bad. At the end of the 19th century, he's got hundreds of thousands of personally owned slaves uh, impressed into the slave labor uh, for the rubber industry. Leopold, in Europe, was at the height of his popularity. But even the wily Leopold couldn't keep his PR machine running forever. Facts eventually caught up with his hype in the person of Edmund Dean Morell, a young shipping clerk in his mid-20s at the time with the Liverpool line that had the contract to carry all supplies to and from the Congo. Posted to Antwerp in 1901 as the company's sales representative there, Morell quickly became aware of several anomalies. First, that the ships bringing the rubber to Belgium were returning to the Congo filled with arms. Second, that hardly anything of value besides the arms was being shipped back to the Congo to pay for the rubber. And finally, that tens of millions in profits were being skimmed off the top directly to Leopold. As Morell was to write in his best-selling expose, The Black Man's Burden, these figures told the story. Forced labor of a terrible and continuous kind, I was giddy and appalled at the cumulative significance of my discoveries. I had stumbled upon a secret society of murderers with a king for a cronyman. Leopold had indeed met a formidable enemy. Morel continued to detail the horrors of the Congo. Lining up support in the British Parliament, he founded the Congo Reform Association with a monthly newsletter. The Archbishop of Canterbury spoke up in support of Morel. Leopold fought, fought back. Within six months, he had created a press bureau that secretly subsidized several Belgian papers and soon had the Brussels correspondence of both the Times of London as well as Germany's most prestigious newspaper on his payroll. The CIA would have been proud of Leopold's performance. But Morel was famous now. When a group of American missionaries invited him to the States, he was received at the White House by President Teddy Roosevelt. In the U.S., like Britain, the cause of Congo reform had become a full-scale crusade. 
But Leopold doubled down in, in his response, lining up a full squadron of lobbyists in Washington. Even in those days, Washington was filled with lobbyists. And then convincing the Vatican that it was all a plot by unscrupulous Protestant missionaries. Baltimore's Cardinal Gibbons spoke out loudly in support of Leopold and was rewarded with Belgium's Grand Cross of the Order of the Crown. By the end of 1906, Leopold, who was still raking in the profits from rubber, decided that the most pragmatic way to tamp down his critics was to formally cede the Congo to the Belgian government, all the while claiming that his only goal had been to bring civilization to the Congo, and denying, of course, that any personal benefit had ever entered his mind. I have not one cent invested in the Congo, he told an American reporter, and I've not received any recompense as Congo executive. By 1908, the deal had been finalized. In addition to assuming the debts from bonds Leopold had sold over the years, the proceeds of which had gone directly into his pocket, the Belgian government paid him, the king of Belgium, 50 million francs as a mark of gratitude for his great sacrifices made for the Congo. 18 months later, the 74-year-old Leopold was dead. There had been more than 20 million people in the Congo in the 1880s when Leopold took it over. At his death, a generation later, the population was estimated to be just half that, 10 million. Now, you might have noticed there are very few heroes in our story so far. By very few, I mean one, David Livingston. Um, we thought for a final chapter we would uh, give you one more authentic hero. Uh, his name uh, is Paul von Leto Forbeck, a German officer uh, who arrives in January 1914 uh, at Dar es Salaam uh, in German East Africa, uh, now Tanzania. Uh, and his role is to take over the Schutztruppe. The Schutztruppe is the tiny little military arm uh, that's there to defend uh, German East Africa. It's 1914. He's a military guy. He, he knows what's happening in Europe. War clouds are gathering. He has a pretty good idea of, if it comes to war, who Germany's enemies are going to be. Uh, and for German East Africa, uh, that's a pretty scary matter because he's likely to face the British uh, coming at him uh, from Kenya and from Uganda and from Zanzibar and from uh, northern Rhodesia. The Portuguese are likely to be uh, enemies of Germany, so coming at him from Mozambique, uh, the French from Madagascar, the Belgians from the Belgian Congo. Uh, a, a very scary picture uh, for a man uh, who is charged with defending the colony. Now, von Leto's superior is the civilian governor of the colony, Heinrich Schnee. For Schnee, when it looks like war is on the horizon, he would rather declare the colony neutral than fight. And an obscure section of the Congo Act of 1885 gives this approach legitimacy. It says, in the event of a European war, the African colonies can declare themselves neutral. And this is the key clause. The Europeans would then be required to refrain from carrying out hostilities in the neutralized territories. All the colonial powers had signed this agreement. So Governor Schnee wouldn't fight at all. Uh, but von Leto has a different idea, which he has, he has uh, elucidated uh, in a memo of April 1914 to Governor, Shea, Governor Schnee. He says, we have it in our power to hinder the enemy uh, by keeping as many troops as possible pinned down uh, in Africa. Uh, everyone who is obliged, every allied uh, soldier obliged to stay here to cope with us is one who can't fight the fatherland uh, in Europe. But what's he got to work with? The Schutztruppe, I said it was tiny, but you know, look how tiny it is. It's himself and 132 German officers uh, and non-coms, 1,500 Askaris. The Askaris uh, are African uh, troopers, uh, native African troopers, uh, recruited to be policemen, originally recruited to be simple policemen. Uh, the German colonials have very little regard for them. They call them kafirs. Kafir is an Afrikaans word, uh, but uh, it's used throughout Europe, uh, throughout Africa, as a term by by Europeans 
uh, as a term of contempt uh, for the blacks, more or less the equivalent uh, of our N-word in English. So they're just a bunch of kefirs. Uh, and Governor, Governor Schnee uh, is very much of this opinion. But Von Leto is not. Von Leto believes uh, that they can be molded into a formidable guerrilla army. Uh, and he, he believes something else. He believes that if it comes to a fight in the bush, only Africans can fight in the bush. Only Africans have the requisite, what he calls, bushmanship. That is, the ability to move through the thorns without getting uh, ripped up, uh, to find water, to find a place to sleep, to move without being detected, uh, to uh, stay warm in the highlands where it gets cold at night, to stay healthy. Bushmanship is what they have. If it comes to a fight in the bush, they have skills. He gives them respect, uh, and they respond to that. Fast forward. It's August 1914. The Great War has just exploded in Europe. In Africa, the undersea telegraph cable connecting German East Africa to Berlin runs through British-controlled Zanzibar. The British initiate hostilities by cutting this cable. So for the rest of the war, the German colonies completely cut off from its headquarters in Berlin. Then the British Navy bombards Dar es Salaam. Meanwhile, von Leto and his Oscaris take the British town of Taveta in the northeast from where they begin to harass the British Uganda Railway. Now at this point, the head of the British Expeditionary Force is General Arthur Aiken. He's utterly confident of victory because he has a plan. The plan is to land his troops in the far northern corner of German East Africa at Tanga, where, he believes, they'll be unopposed. From there, he'll move up the railway to where von Lettau is, wipe out his forces. How hard could that be, Aiken figures? Just over 100 Germans in command of a few Kaffirs. And from there, up the Uganda Railway, across Lake Victoria, accept Governor Schnee's surrender at Tabora, then secure Dar es Salaam from behind and occupy the whole colony before the rains. Well, that was the plan. He has 8,000 soldiers at, at his disposal, uh, most of them Indians. Uh, for instance, the 13th Rajput Rifles. Uh, they have been at sea for three weeks. They've come over in 21 ships from uh, Bombay. They're badly seasick and exhausted. So 21 ships escorted by two elderly uh, battleships. They're exhausted. But Aiken doesn't let them get off and get their, their land legs under them, uh, relax a little bit before going into battle. No. Uh, he uh, pulls up his uh, ships close, to, uh, enough, close enough to offload equipment for a whole day, uh, still keeps the troops on board until all the heavy equipment has been offloaded uh, to the beaches north of Tanga. Uh, and then finally, he lets the troops off and sends them immediately into the city. Uh, they run across the, uh, the field uh, that separates them from Tanga, uh, where they are attacked in the undergrowth. They are attacked by savage bees. This is called the Battle of the Bees, because the bees weigh in heavily uh, in, uh, in opposition to the British. Um, they, they race forward to get away from the bees, and whoops, Von Leto and the Ascaris are there. This was not part of the plan, but there they are, uh, with Maxim guns. A thousand dead Rajaputs in less time than it takes to say it. The Indian troops drop their rifles. They race back to the ships and demand to be taken aboard. They refuse to fight. Uh, Aiken argues with them for a little bit and finally gives in, loads them on board, steams away, and leaves all the equipment behind, brand new rifles uh, for all the Ascaris and two million rounds uh, of ammunition. Now, the British embarrassed, obviously, take revenge by destroying the German light cruiser Königsberg, which had been hiding in the Refugee River Delta, leaving her a total wreck. But von Lettau quickly organizes his troops to muscle off the cruiser's 10 heavy guns, which he then uses to attack the highlands of, Brit of Britain's East Africa colony near Mount Kilimanjaro, which von Lettau and his 1,500 Kaffirs will hold through the entire year of 1915. But, but now the tide is about to turn. Uh, in December 1915, the British disembark 100,000 troops uh, in Mombasa. Uh, they reinforce the trains uh, and prepare to head north to take on uh, w what they now realize is a formidable force, uh, Von Leto and the Ascaris. 
uh, but they have brought uh, a lot of uh, soldiers to do the trick. Uh, Christmas 1915, uh, Von Leto addresses the Ascaris and says, we're going to henceforth fight a very different battle. Uh, we're not going to attempt to hold any territory. What we're going to do is withdraw into the bush, draw the Germans along with us, uh, ambush them, attack, disappear before they can get off a shot, uh, withdraw, ambush, attack, disappear, withdraw. Uh, he plans his battles. He's only got 1,500 troops. Uh, he plans his battles uh, with zero casualties in mind. It's part, one of the reasons his troops are so loyal. He can't afford to lose people. So his idea is to withdraw so quickly that the others, that the British can't even respond. Um, uh, in uh, January 1916, uh, the British do proceed north along uh, the Uganda Railway uh, up to the area near Kilimanjaro where Von Leto is, and the great withdrawal begins. Uh, it lasts uh, for two and a half years. Uh, withdraw all through the bush, in the bush. Withdraw, ambush, attack, disappear, withdraw, ambush, attack, disappear, with, uh, with, withdraw. The Ascaris are on foot. The British are trying to follow them uh, in motorized vehicles, but it's the bush. It's the most inhospitable, imaginable territory to move through uh, in anything motorized. Uh, they, uh, this is bushmanship. The Ascaris are moving faster on foot than the British can move uh, in their vehicles. Summer of 1916, the British commit another 100,000 troops. They are obsessed now. We've got to catch this guy. We've got to end this debacle. January 1917, two and a half years into the war, the Oscaris under von Leto are holed up in the swamplands of the Rafiji Delta, which, as Tom just said, the British motorized units are unable to enter. Meanwhile, back in Germany, the war in Europe isn't going at all well, so von Lettau has become a rock star, the only real winner on the whole German team. The Kaiser awards him the Prussian Order of Merit, but since the Brits have cut the cable lines, the Kaiser has no way to tell von Leto of his award. Now remember, this is the First World War, the Great War, still a gentleman's war. So get this, the British hoist a white flag and traipse across the swamplands to tell to the German camp to tell von Lettu the good news. <laughs> but back to the war, November 1917. The Brits have pinned von Leto against the border between German East Africa and the Portuguese colony of Mozambique, trapping him and his Oscaris between the British Army and their Portuguese allies. It's the first battle the Portuguese soldiers in Africa have faced. So it's a fair question. Will the Portuguese fight? <laughs> Evidently not. Uh, the Schutz the Truppe pick up all of the weaponry uh, that the Portuguese have left behind, medical supplies and food, enough to last them through the whole rest of the war. Uh, by that July, they've moved deep into, uh, into Portuguese territory. Uh, and now the British, completely obsessed, we've got to end, this is a debacle, we look really stupid, commit another huge slot of uh, a spate of, of reinforcements uh, from South Africa uh, and from northern Rhodesia. And now they try this thing that they've been trying all along, which is to flank uh, the Ascaris uh, by uh, going around them on the two sides. Uh, normally, the Ascaris have just hurried ahead because they move faster than the British. But this time, Von Leto chooses to go backward. Uh, and he goes back into uh, German East Africa. He does what in football would be called the quarterback draw, uh, where you suck the defenders in and you shoot up the middle, uh, and it's exactly what he has done here. Uh, over the next months, uh, he carries on through German East Africa uh, and into northern Rhodesia with the British trailing behind him, uh, frustrated uh, as ever. November 11th, 1918, Armistice Day, finds him uh, in the Rhodesian town of, uh, of Kasama, uh, where he's given proof by the British under a white flag uh, that the Kaiser has surrendered, uh, and he himself surrenders uh, to the British. Uh, so what have they accomplished? I mean, the, the Germans did lose the war in spite of all this. What did they accomplish? Well, only exactly what they set out to accomplish. With this tiny little uh, Schutztruppe, they have pinned down 
uh, more than a quarter of a million troops uh, that would have otherwise uh, been available to fight uh, in Europe. The Ascaris are the stars here. They have proved themselves to be absolutely everything that the Europeans have been saying black Africans simply cannot be. Courageous, disciplined, uh, and resourceful. They have fought, Von Leto and the Ascaris have fought the entire war, and they've never lost a single battle. And that was it. The scramble was over. The surrender of the ironically victorious Von Leto, as Tom pointed out, he never lost a single battle, was the last chapter. Indeed, his African campaign is a nice metaphor for the whole European adventure there. Even if you won, you lost. The Europeans, not the Germans anymore, of course, were to hang on in Africa through the Second World War. When the end finally came, the late 1950s, it came suddenly and it was unstoppable. As you've seen, colonization was a disaster for the Africans, but it was a lose-lose. The Europeans hardly got much out of their efforts. Uganda, Kenya, Tanganyika, the Congo, money losers all. The Germans had four colonies spread out on both sides of the continent and lost money on each one every year. The French colonies were a drain start to finish, which is why they closed down all their sub-Saharan ones at the very start of the descramble. The Brits were able to suck a little profit out of South Africa over the years, but they took a bath everywhere else. The bottom line, there were no winners in Africa, white or black. The British were able to hang on in southern Rhodesia, Zimbabwe, until 1980 the final European colony, the 46th to be freed. The end of our story, the end of the old Africa. But, but, uh, but, but wait, Mac, the new Africa, aren't we going to tell them about the new Africa? No, Tom, for that they're going to have to go to this year's Camden <laughs> Conference. <laughs> <laughs>